Hey everyone, I'm going to get started. So we're going to start by uh, wrapping up the section on morality and religion. We have to talk about one more reading related to that, and then we'll get started on chapter six. So towards the end of last class, I talked about how uh, when it comes to pro-social behavior, so things like charitable donations and volunteering, uh, the relationship between uh, those measures and religiosity is pretty uniformly positive. Uh, the last reading has to do with the relationship between religiosity and prejudice. Uh, and a very helpful review paper uh, breaks it down by different types of religious orientation, uh, specifically four, uh, each of which you'll see talked about a lot in the literature. Uh, the first two uh, go together. They're sort of uh, different measures, uh, often uh, included in the same scales. And those are uh, intrinsic religiosity and extrinsic religiosity. As I said uh, at the end of last class, these don't have to do with like which religion it is. Uh, these can exist within uh, any religion. Intrinsic religiosity means that your religious practice flows from uh, an internalized, deep, and sincere faith. So. Uh, you're not doing it for pragmatic reasons. You're doing it because you have a, a commitment to the religion that you've internalized. An extrinsic religious orientation uh, means that you do it for um, other reasons. So you go there because you like the people, or you think religion has benefits in the world. Things like that would fall under an extrinsic religious motivation. Uh, another type of orientation is a quest orientation. This is a more open-minded kind of religious commitment. You see uh, religious faith as a kind of journey. You don't claim to have certainty in any particular religion. You see it as a kind of spiritual quest. So more doubting, more flexibility. And then the fourth one is uh, fundamentalism. This is one where uh, you have certainty that your beliefs are correct, uh, that your religion is the absolute truth, uh, and you tend to take uh, the truth of your religion literally. So unlike the quest orientation, uh, this kind of orientation is associated with more closed-mindedness. Okay, so those are the four basic orientations. Any questions about them? Uh, the book mentions that in the case of the first two, apparently there's some um, questions about the validity of the scales, but uh, if you use the uh, standard scales for each, you find that uh, different types of orientation have different types of relationships with prejudice. So this is the thing I teased you with at the end of the last lecture. So let me just explain what everything here means. So you'll see at the top there's uh, the four uh, religious orientations. And then here uh, on the, uh, on my right, your left, uh, are different uh, types of intolerance. So intolerance towards ethnic groups, uh, towards uh, LGBT people, uh, and so on. So if it's, uh, and these, the numbers correspond to how many studies find a particular kind of correlation. So if it's under the plus, so for example, there's you know one study that finds a positive correlation between intrinsic uh, religiosity and uh, uh, to uh, intolerance towards religious outgroups, that means that intrinsic religiosity is associated with more intolerance towards religious outgroups. Although in that case, only one study. If it's zero, that means they found uh, n nothing statistically significant in either direction. Minus means negative. So just 
And now I'll go through what it says, but does that make sense as far as the layout? So here's what you find. Uh, in the case of intrinsic religiosity, uh, and extrinsic for that matter, it kind of varies. So some positive findings, some negative. So in the case of intrinsic, um, there's more positive for uh, several of them. Uh, the exception is for uh, racial or ethnic intolerance where it's negative. So more intrinsic re uh, religiosity associated with less uh, racism. This is consistent with my experience. If I had to classify my parents, so as I say, I was raised uh, Christian, uh, I wouldn't describe them as hateful, but they would have said, for example, uh, you know, homosexuality is sinful, uh, even if they weren't uh, hateful about it. But when it came to racism, if anything, they were more like the stereotypical white liberal parents uh, that were trying too hard the other way. Uh, my dad would sometimes say, oh, this family's too white, it's too boring, you guys need to mix it up a little bit. <laughs> so, um, still maybe potentially problematic, but not the kind of racism you have to worry about. Uh, but he would not have said, one of you guys should marry a dude. He would, he would not have said that. So the first pattern makes sense to me. Um, uh, and with extrinsic too, a bit, uh, it's a bit varied. It depends on uh, the type of prejudice. Uh, but in the case of a quest religious orientation, it's almost uniformly negative, um, which in this case negative is good. So a quest orientation is negatively correlated with different types of intolerance. Uh, whereas for fundamentalism, uh, almost uniformly positive, meaning more fundamentalism is associated with uh, more prejudice. Uh, the book then, or not the book, the paper goes through different possible explanations. Don't worry about that for the test. Uh, but you should know the basic pattern where intrinsic and extrinsic religiosity, kind of complicated the, the relationship between them and prejudice, whereas quest uh, orientation is negatively associated with prejudice, fundamentalism positively associated with prejudice. Any questions on that? Yeah. Can you repeat for extrinsic? Yeah, so if you have an extrinsic religiosity, you engage in religious practice not because you have a deep, sincere belief in it, necessarily, but for the kind of practical social benefits. You go to church because you like the people, you help out because you think the church is doing good work in the community, that sort of thing. Can you explain extrinsic in terms of the data there again as well? Yeah, so for both, all you need to know is that for both intrinsic and extrinsic, it, it's kind of complicated, it depends on which type of prejudice. So, for extrinsic, there's some that find a positive relationship between it and prejudice. Some find a negative relationship. Uh, same with intrinsic. You don't need to know more detail than that. Yeah. Sorry, can you quickly re-explain the quest? Yeah, a quest orientation is the more open-minded type. So uh, more open to doubt and viewing religious practice as a kind of spiritual journey. You don't say, no, I've arrived at the one final truth. You say, we're all on a journey to uh, get closer to the truth or something like that. Okay, I don't see any other hands. So the next chapter uh, is on the relationship between emotions and moral judgment. Uh, the chapter after that is basically about the same thing, uh, just with different terms. So for the remaining portion of the unit, uh, that's what most of our discussion will be about, uh, the relationship between uh, emotion and morality. So chapter six starts off with a description of a being called droid, so some kind of robot or AI that someone builds. And uh, 
Leave aside your doubts about whether this is possible. Let's suppose we could know for sure that uh, <coughs> this being exists and has the following capacities. So it's self-conscious, so it's, it's self-aware. It has a lot of cognitive uh, complexity, so it's, it would have a high IQ, if you want to put it that way. Uh, it can form goals, form plans, uh, and additionally, it can evaluate different sorts of actions. So it has you know, code saying, do not kill innocent sentient beings without uh, justification. However, what this droid lacks is emotions. Now, I'm not saying, and I don't think Tiberius is saying, it's impossible for a robot to have emotions, but this particular AI, or uh, droid, uh, does not have emotions. So if it does something, uh, it can't feel guilty, it can't feel sympathy or empathy, or compassion for other people. Uh, it's just evaluating uh, actions in terms of uh, the rational, or rational justification or lack thereof. Now, based on your sense of what the term morality means, uh, what Tiberius asks is, uh, can this droid engage in genuine moral action or moral evaluation? Uh, show of hands, who's inclined to say yes? Who's inclined to say no? So most people, that's the intuition that Tiberius wants us to have. So um, some philosophers have argued that uh, we should view morality as a purely rational enterprise and try to disconnect it from emotion. But what this thought experiment is supposed to bring out, and apparently uh, it did so successfully, is uh, moral judgment is inextricably linked with emotion, at least in the way that we ordinarily think about morality. So, what the first bulk of the chapter uh, talks about then is what are emotions? You know, philosophers like defining their terms, so uh, emotion is an ordinary language term. What are some of the features that emotions have? Uh, there's an ongoing debate about the nature of emotions, uh, and we'll go through some of the history of different theories. Uh, in graduate school, I took a course on the history of emotion theory with a, an Italian philosopher. I'll, I'll talk about him later. He's, he's quoted at one point in the book. But one thing he said that uh, virtually all theorists agree on today is that emotions are multi-componential, meaning multiple components. What different theories do is uh, they emphasize different components. So uh, some theories will take one or two components of emotions and say those are the primary or defining features. But uh, the book lists a couple of different, or more than a couple of different features that I think pretty much everyone would agree emotions uh, are constituted by. Uh, so these are good to know. Uh, the first one is intentionality. Now, one really frustrating thing about philosophy is sometimes words are used in different senses. So intentionality, usually in philosophy, does not mean on purpose. That's usually what it means in ordinary language. It means something like aboutness. So to say that an emotion has intentionality means that it's about something. So obviously beliefs have intentionality. That's the easier case. Like if I believe that uh, Mars has two moons, that means I have a mental state that is about Mars. It has, so the belief has intentionality. Uh, to say that emotions have intentionality is to say, you know, so something like, um, you know, jealousy is that's about uh, perceived infidelity. That's what it's directed at. You know, anger is directed at perceived slights, uh, and so on. Uh, another feature they have is, uh, the book uses the term importance, but again, what it really means is uh, evaluativeness. So if I feel sad, part of what that means is I judge that my life is not going well. It's an evaluation I'm making. 
Uh, defining emotions in that way kind of blurs the line between them and beliefs, uh, but many contemporary theories of emotions emphasize the ways in which emotions are at least somewhat uh, like beliefs. That may upset Hume a little bit, but uh, that's another feature that many theories of emotions have. Relatedly, uh, emotions can be judged in rational terms. They can uh, have or fail to have rationality. This is why we have terms like overreaction. Right? We can say, uh, that emotion was not an appropriate response. That was not rational given what you face. So think of like the office, you know. Uh, someone hides uh, Andy Bernard's phone and he punches a wall and screams, you know. Uh, we would say that's an irrational kind of emotion to have in response to that. Uh, phenomenology. This is a really contentious term in philosophy. So phenomenology means uh, the emotions feel like something. They have an inner conscious what it feels like to have the experience. Uh, this is, there's a whole debate about this. I, I talk about it in 405. Uh, the whole con there's a controversy about how to explain how states like this can arise from the brain, how it can be that mental states f feel like something. Some people think phenomenology is scientifically intractable. Others uh, disagree. We won't get into that debate. And then, sorry, just two more. Uh, Motivation. This is one that uh, my professor thought was the most important feature of emotions. Um, I'm inclined to agree. So, uh, motivation means emotions get you to do things, they make you want to do things. And in fact, the word emotion comes from, I think it's Latin, whatever. Uh, its uh, etymology relates to the word to move. Now, I don't think that etymology necessarily settles what a term means, but uh, for many people, this is the most important feature. Emotions uh, dispose us to behave in certain ways. So, you know, if you're angry, it makes you want to hit someone. Uh, that, uh, that's part of uh, what it means to be angry. And then last feature, uh, and this is one that many of the theories you would have looked at in uh, intro psych talked about, emotions generally have a bodily component. So when you're afraid, your face makes a particular uh, expression, your heart rate goes up, your palms get sweaty, etc. So as I say, different theories will emphasize uh, different features, but most people will agree uh, that emotions have these uh, multiple components. <coughs> any questions about any of those? Yeah. Can you explain the importance again? Yeah, so importance or evaluativeness meaning, um, so uh, think of uh, the emotion to be sad. Part of what it means to be sad is you, or at least some part of your, your brain, is evaluating that your life sucks. Uh, if you're happy, that part of what that means is you're evaluating that your life is going well. Yeah. Uh, could you uh, repeat what phenomenology means? Yeah, this one's a tough, uh, so it means it feels like something to have the experience. There's an, so this is what some people think AI would lack, right? And AI could go, beep, bop, ow, that hurt, pull its hand away. But from the inside, it doesn't feel like anything. Now, in 405, I explained why um, I think in principle uh, an AI could be conscious, but intuitively many people think this is something that an AI would lack. Yep. How is the um, phenomenology different from the bodily reaction, like your heart rate and everything? Good question. So some people are going to say that there's not a difference. So some people are going to say that phenomenology just is your body and brain having a particular reaction. Um, but uh, that's a controversial view. So the book lists this as a feature. Um, as far as getting the intuition why some people think they're different, think again of an AI. You could, many people think you could build an AI that, I don't know, had various internal mechanisms move, kind of like our bodies react, or maybe make a facial expression. Uh, but some people think it wouldn't feel like anything for the AI to touch the hot stove and pull away or to look sad. Um, some people think that only we have that. 
that. So I'm not defending that view, but uh, that's what phenomenology is. It's what it feels like to experience something from the first person point of view. Yeah. See no other hands. Oh, yeah. Sorry, one more question. Yeah, of course. So what would the distinction be then between like the bodily component and then the phenomenology? Yeah, so she has the same thing. So some people think there, won't, there isn't a difference. Um, here's what I'll say. If you're confused about the extent to which there is a difference between those two, that won't trip you up on the test. If you want to treat those as the same thing, you'll be fine. I think, in fact, uh, there's a sense in which they basically are the same thing. Uh, the book talks about both. That's why I list them differently, but if it gives you a headache trying to think about why they're different, don't, don't worry too much about it. Okay, so speaking of, uh, oh no, sorry, this one comes first. So, uh, as I say, some people emphasize, uh, including my professor, the motivational component. Uh, my professor's name, by the way, was uh, Andrea Scarantino. Uh, and just a little story about him. So he's quoted as one of the uh, philosophers who emphasizes the role of motivation. Uh, my first day at Georgia State University, we had to meet everyone, all the professors and the new graduate students. Uh, and everyone had to say what their name was and where they were from. Most of them were Americans. So they'd say, oh, you know, my name's John, I'm from New York whatever. It got to uh, Andrea Scarantino, who none of us knew. We didn't know who he was. Or, and he opened his mouth and let out the most Italian accent it's possible for a human being to speak with, and said, oh, my name is Andrea Scarantino, and I'm from Alabama. And, and so that was, that, that's my first memory of uh, Scarantino. Uh, so that's one view, uh, according to which the central or defining feature uh, of emotions is their motivation, or uh, the extent to which they are motivated states. An older theory that emphasizes the bodily component is uh, William James's theory. So according to this theory, uh, and you may have seen this in uh, Psych 104, uh, the bodily states always come first, uh, and the sense that you're feeling an emotion comes after. It's a very counterintuitive view, uh, but the view would be, you know, when I'm walking through the woods and uh, hear uh, animal footsteps behind me, what happens is my heart rate goes up and my palms get sweaty, and then I feel afraid. In fact, my fear is just my awareness of these bodily changes. So that's a, a rather simplistic uh, theory of emotion, but that's one that would fall under uh, feeling or bodily theories of emotion. Uh, I already mentioned motivational theories, so uh, that would include my uh, professor from Georgia State. Uh, and then some that were, uh, became popular after the cognitive revolution are cognitive theories of emotions. These are theories that emphasize the ways in which uh, emotions are evaluations of the world, the, uh, the ways in which they are sort of like beliefs. So for these theorists, to feel afraid, at least part of what that means is uh, I believe that there's something dangerous. That's one, for them, one of the central features of, emo, of, um, of different emotions. Uh, I list the Stoics in the key terms. Don't worry about that. They're, you can think of them as a kind of precursor to the cognitive theories, uh, but we don't have to get into the Stoics. Yep? Sorry, can you kind of explain the difference between beliefs and emotions? Yeah, so it's, it's controversial. So the, the cognitive theory blurs the line. Um, so beliefs are easier to define. Beliefs are representations of the way the world is, or at least attempts to represent the way the world is. So if I uh, believe that um, Paris is the capital of France, it means my mind slash brain represents that Paris is the capital of France. So emotions, much harder to define, in part because they probably involve multiple components. 
But what the cognitive theorists want to say is, a central feature of emotion is that they also represent the way the world is. So when I feel afraid, what that means is my brain, or at least part of my brain, represents that there is danger nearby, or something like that. Or if I feel jealous, it means I represent that there's infidelity. Uh, one specific cognitive theory that is good to know, this is really review from intro, but it's a very famous uh, theory of emotion. And I apologize, it's misspelled in the key terms. This is the Schachter, Singer, or the two-factor theory. Uh, I mean, I'm sure it won't trip you up, but uh, it's, right now it says S-C-H-A-C-T-E-R. Uh, both the C's should be C-H, so it's... Uh, S-C-H-A-C-H-T-E-R. So uh, Stanley Schachter and Jerome Singer developed this theory. Um, and it says that, or it emphasizes the way in which uh, emotions have two main features. So for these people, the two main theories of, or the two main features of emotion are the bodily component uh, and your interpretation of that bodily component. These two uh, together produce uh, emotion. So for William James, who's kind of uh, out of date, uh, if you're walking through the woods, you hear footsteps behind you, your heart rate starts to become fast, and then that makes you feel afraid. One criticism of that theory is that if you do physiological measures of people when they're feeling different emotions, it's hard to find distinct physiological signatures. One intuitive way to think about that, think about the difference between feeling surprised and feeling afraid. Think about for, like, the state of your body. It's not really all that different, and, and the physiology bears that out. Um, so uh, that means a simplistic theory like William James really can't be right. So for Stanley and or for uh, Schachter and Singer, uh, to uh, use the same example, I'm walking through the woods, I hear footsteps behind me, my heart rate goes up. If I turn around and it's a wolf, I interpret uh, the fast heart rate as meaning fear. If I turn around and it's a friend, I interpret it as I'm excited to see my friend. Uh, so that's the uh, Schachter Singer or two factor uh, theory of emotion. So, uh, there are a lot of famous uh, studies uh, that fall under this category. One kind of fun one was done in Canada, in Vancouver. Uh, they uh, had an attractive woman stand at the end of two different bridges. Any of you remember this from intro? Only oh, a handful. Okay, so uh, men would come across the bridge. Uh, she talked with them uh, for a bit. Uh, and at the end of it, uh, it involves her giving them uh, her number. And men who walk across the scary bridge are more likely to call her later. And the two-factor theory interpretation of this is you have the fast heart rate, and if you're looking at you know, a beautiful woman, you think, oh, this means I'm attracted to her. Uh, so that's an example. I'll show a video of this study, kind of a cute, famous study, uh, as an illustration of this. Okay, so kind of a funny little study. Uh, another study that uh, provide some support for this view. Uh, this one I'm going to walk through carefully to make sure I don't mess it up. Uh, so they would bring people into the lab and uh, give them uh, either a placebo or adrenaline. So with regard to uh, the drug, or I guess drug isn't the right word, but is what they're given. Uh, they're either given adrenaline or a placebo. Uh, and then they're either told this is adrenal or this is adrenaline, it may make you feel kind of jittery and energetic, or they are not told anything about what they're given. So are they told about uh, the side effects, 
yes up here, no here. Of course, in the case of the placebo, they're being told this falsely, but you still have to uh, include that. Uh, and then they are put in a situation where uh, they are either the situation makes them feel angry or happy. I forget the detail, but uh, some kind of situation where they could feel uh, a particular emotion. The situation, uh, and so sometimes it's anger, sometimes it's uh, happy. I forget exactly how they manipulate each, but uh, they are, the situation encourages them to feel a particular emotion. In both cases, they feel the emotion most strongly in this condition. The condition where they are not told about the side effects and they are given adrenaline. So it makes sense they feel the most in this condition, right? When you're kind of in a heightened state, you will feel the emotions more strongly. But if you're told, hey, we gave you some adrenaline, you'll feel a little jittery, then when they feel it, they go, oh, this isn't anger or happiness, this is just the adrenaline they gave. If they don't have that explanation, they feel that heightened state, they're in a situation that encourages them to feel angry or happy, and they attribute that internal state to, uh, to the emotion, whether it's anger or happiness. Does that make sense? Does the connection between this and the two-factor theory make sense? Of course, uh, so then the uh, book goes back to Hume. So some of the theories we've talked about, Hume might be a bit uncomfortable with. Remember that Hume draws a sharp line between beliefs and desires, or what he would call uh, beliefs and uh, the passions. That was the term that he preferred. Uh, the idea that uh, emotions have an evaluative or cognitive component may have made him uncomfortable. So uh, yeah, the, the next section is, I guess, review from the Humean theory of motivation. Uh, beliefs and reasoning about your beliefs cannot lead you, Hume thinks, uh, to a moral conclusion, at least not independently of desire. Uh, reason is a tool. It can help you get what you want, for Hume, uh, but it can't tell you what you, or it can't make you want something. Wants just come with your uh, human nature. Reason is just about how to get different goals. And moral judgment falls on the emotion side of that. It falls out of our uh, nature as social creatures. We feel sympathy or empathy for uh, people in our lives. Uh, we want to help them. We want them to, uh, you know, we don't like to see them suffer. Uh, so for Hume, emotion is inextricably linked with, uh, with moral judgment. So that made, so a Humean would have also raised his or her hand at the beginning to say that someone like uh, you know, Droid is not capable of uh, moral judgment, at least not in the same sense that we are. Now, Hume's uh, theory is strictly conceptual. It's not an empirical claim, uh, but there are interesting empirical uh, findings that the uh, book talks about that could be seen as having some family, resembling, family resemblance to Hume's claim. And that's that uh, manipulating emotions, uh, what the book calls incidental emotions. So by incidental, it means emotions you happen to be feeling at the time that you make a moral judgment. So it's not, it's not moral emotions like outrage or guilt or shame. Uh, those have, uh, at least in some cases, moral content. But things like how grossed out do you feel? How happy do you feel? Uh, you can manipulate that before putting someone in a situation where they have to make a moral judgment and the finding is that doing so uh, can change people's moral judgments, even though they're not aware that, the, that it's the emotion that's uh, changing it. So uh, I'll show a video of Robert Sapolsky uh, talking about some of this, both some of the findings and the uh, possible evolutionary basis of the connection between incidental emotions and moral judgment. So uh, consistent with what Sapolsky said in that video, 
Uh, the book talks about some studies where uh, if you put people in different rooms, like an experiment where you randomly assign people to different conditions, if there's smelly garbage in the room, uh, people are more likely to make a morally harsh judgment about someone. Uh, so, consistent with what he said, where uh, regions like the insular cortex that are originally evolved for these very basic things like toxin detection are then kind of duct taped uh, on to do other sorts of work. Uh, thus making us susceptible to things like uh, confusing uh, a disgust reaction with a moral reaction. Okay, any questions about that? So the next section will lead us into another reading, uh, and that section is on psychopaths. So I'm sure many of you are interested in psychopaths. Um, and I don't know how much time we'll have to do a lot of detail here. Um, and we are further ahead than I thought we would be, so uh, maybe I'll just leave you with that. We can call, uh, call it a week early. Uh, so I'll see you next class for a discussion of the psychopaths.